All right. How's it going, guys? We're, we're out of room. This is awesome. All right. Who here is a developer? Couple hands. Awesome. Um, I just broke a rule that I actually just told, said somebody I, yesterday I wouldn't do. I wouldn't ask people if they're developers because a lot of us think that we're not developers because it's not in our job title. But I think we got to remember in IT and really anything IT related right now, in a few years we're all going to be developers, right? Programming skills are core. But what I'm going to show you guys today, what we're really going to talk about is how we're bringing that relevancy, how we're bringing those tool sets to people who don't have coding skills. But also how people are doing programming, how they're being developers with tool sets that make them more efficient, make them more product productive throughout their day. Um, but you don't have to be a coder. I know coding, I know programming, but I use a lot of the tools here because it's faster, it's easier. There's nothing wrong with doing some, some uh, drag and drop editing if it makes my day more productive, right? So I think that's the number one thing is when, when we ask if you're a developer, we don't mean if it's in your title. <laughs> we don't mean if you're the head of application development. We should all be pretty excited about raising our hands about that because a lot of cool things are coming out around development. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about integration platforms. Um, do you guys know what that means? Anybody? I don't have enough swag to get any swag to give away, unfortunately. But um, I will, hopefully, we make this interactive, right? If you guys have questions, if you have thoughts, want to interject, definitely please feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, Integration platforms are tools that connect to lots of other libraries or APIs in the cloud and allow you to, as an end user, quickly configure and connect lots of cloud services. Probably the biggest one you've all used or have heard of the most is if this, then that, right? Anybody use that at home as a, 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 an end user, a, a geek? No? Couple? Okay. So if this, then that, we'll go through an example allows me to select a couple different cloud solutions and tie them together to, to customize my workflow. Um, so from an agenda, I'm going to start off with kind of the, 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 the groundwork or the framework that, that, uh, of, of the tools that are available and the APIs that third parties have used to integrate and create these integration platforms. Then we're going to go into a little bit about kind of programming the web. And I'm going to give you guys some real world examples of how customers are using these integration platforms. And there's a lot of these that are starting to come into the enterprise from the consumer space. Um, but this isn't new. The difference is, is that they, the, is the breadth, right? And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we'll go through a couple different demos and, uh, and have some Q&A. So, before we dive in, I think it's important, I always like to talk a little bit about the business relevancy of, of some of these tools. Why is that? Well, only a few of us are developers, right? What we're, what we're focused on with integration platforms is solving business problems. I think that's important to understand is that the most important use case here is the use case, okay? So we've got to think about how we're impacting our business, our customers. And some of these tools, I'm going to show you a few where dragging and dropping a couple lines and maybe four or five minutes of coding, quote unquote coding, can dramatically change the way your business runs or your customers. So some of these tools are really exciting because we now have the tools to agilely change the business processes within our own company and our own organization. And I'll share one with you that we use internally. So there's a lot of shifts happening in industries because they can quickly change their business models. They can quickly change the way they interact with all the different tool sets they're using. We're seeing this in, in just about every industry. And the first question I always get asked is, is why is this relevant to collaboration? Why do we even care in, in the collaboration world? And I think the short answer is, is it really is how we affect the agility of a business. And everybody kind of defines agility a little bit differently. Um, you'll also see that we, some people say it's to digitize your business. That's the new four letter word in IT this year, kind of like BYOD. It's just the term everybody loves to use. But what do we mean by that? If I look at the history of, of Cisco Collab, I like to think of it on this curve of evolution. And how many people are Cisco Collab customers? OK, most people here. We started by converging to voice, video, and data networks, right? 
with voice over IP solutions. How many people in your HR department called you and said, thank you for that, right? Well, they probably didn't notice that there was a dynamic improvement in efficiency, management operations, that you had lower costs. It didn't change their agility. It didn't change the way they do business, right? Well, we started to deliver collaboration tools that maybe improved their productivity, made their collaboration easier or more seamless. Okay, now we're starting to impact the way they deliver business. But now we're going into this accelerated curve, starting with accelerating with hybrid. What do I mean by that? How many people have WebRTC applications in their environment? Couple, all right. Do you love when Chrome and Firefox push browser updates and you just cross your fingers and hope that it doesn't break your entire infrastructure? Right? Okay, you're laughing because you know the pain point. That's what we mean by accelerate with hybrid, right? We're taking the pieces that are agile, constantly changing, that are impossible to manage on-prem, and we're divorcing those. We're putting them into the cloud where we can manage those for you. But we're tying it to that on-prem hybrid infrastructure so that you can have that on-prem static, highly stable environment on-prem, and we can manage the highly changing pieces in the cloud. So we're accelerating, and now the business can start to leverage mobile-first applications, web-based applications, and you as an individual, the infrastructure you've deployed can leverage the agility of that organization. They can start to leverage the different pieces of the investment you've made just by how we're deploying it differently in the cloud. But the major benefit we get from moving some of these pieces to the cloud is not only are the standards changing, the browser support, the code, but now we have a place to integrate in a standards way. How many people think Amazon Echo natively understands Cisco Call Manager Axle APIs? Probably never would ever happen, right? But when we move it to the cloud, we can connect those things seamlessly and easily without any coding, without any programming. So now everybody in my business has the ability to connect to my collaboration platform, to change the way they work, and that's why this agility really changes. A lot of that comes around APIs. Um, I like to use this analogy because we talk about APIs, and I think people get scared. They think, oh my god, I don't know what an API is. I don't know the coding. I don't know what's behind it. I don't think you really need to. I think what we need to understand is the outcomes. And this is more of, a, of an awareness thing. And I liken this to websites. In 1995, if I went to a customer or a random member of the public, maybe a plumber, and I said, do you have a website? That plumber would tell me, why do I need a website? I'm a plumber, right? But five short years later, I go to that same person and I ask them, do they have a website? That plumber would tell me, of course I have a website. I'm a plumber. Nobody uses a phone book anymore. They all go on the web, right? Now, that plumber didn't know what HTML was. They didn't know how a website was run. They didn't know what an IP address was. They didn't know any of the technical details. What they did know was, their business value proposition of it's easier to be found. It's easier for our customers. And this is the way my customers expect to find me now. To, su to, to survive in this world, I need to leverage these technologies, right? Now, I like to point out their website here was a GeoCities website, right, in 2000. But the same thing is happening in APIs. In 2010, if I went to a plumber and I asked them, do you have APIs? We can all kind of laugh and be like, well, why would a plumber need APIs, right? They're, they're going to fix my, my plumbing issues. They don't need an API. Well, I'm from Denver, Colorado in the United States, and there's a local company called Service Magic. And uh, in 2012, uh, Service Magic was a six to eight person dispatch center. They basically had a, a, a party line, and they would answer it, and they'd call out to a plumber on a radio and dispatch them to your house and then send you a bill later. Well, a developer asked them, do you have APIs? They thought it was a plumbing service. They didn't have any clue what this was. It wasn't core to their business, right? So they actually just kind of asked them to go away. It's kind of a funny interaction. Five short years later, if we go to a plumbing company, and in this case, three years later, if we go to a plumbing company and ask them, do you have APIs, now the answer is becoming yes. Service Magic hired their first developer and wrote an API to connect to their backend system. And shortly after, got $2 million in seed round funding as an investor. And now, three years later, they have 100 full-time developers and are now the US 
company called Home Advisor. Okay? They dispatch globally now plumbing services. They didn't know what that was three years ago. It's now core to their business model. These are the transformations that are taking place in every one of our customer bases. And that's why it's important to know that the tools that we're delivering, somewhere in your organization, there are people thinking like this. How can we scale? How can we grow? How can we do it dynamically? How can we do it programmatically? And you don't have to be a developer or a coder to be relevant in that conversation. We're going to show some, some cool tools there. So that's why everything that we've come out with at Cisco is very API-centric. That's why we have DevNet. That's why, we're, that's why this whole room exists now is because that transformation is taking place within our customer base. So we started with a Tropa acquisition, which we'll talk a little bit about, Spark for developers, and then now all of our Spark call and Spark room systems, all very API-centric. And the developer story is very important to us because if I'm a plumbing company, even if I'm a plumbing company, my business might change overnight. And if I now am automated and my workflows are automated, our tools need to be able to connect to that as well. Um, I saw a lot of people raise their hands when they said they were Cisco UC customers. Um, Jonathan Rosenberg says this best. <coughs> um, I used to be a collab practice lead and do a lot of implementations. And when I first saw this, this really spoke to me. It's why I kind of sat down and started playing with some of the tools and, and learning some of these things. He said, the core competency for a collab specialist is shifting away from these core networking skills and moving more towards these software, software skills. When was the last time anybody debugged a T1 clock slip, <laughs> right? Hopefully not recently. We're moving away from those skills as a collab engineer, and we're moving more towards the tools we're talking about today. And that's exciting for me, because we're, it, it's making every one of us more relevant to the business. When you fix a clock slip on a T1, you're just bringing the telephony service back up. When you bring something that enhances somebody's productivity and workday, you're changing the way your company does business. And I think that's, that's huge, right? All right. So that's why this is important. That's why it's been important to Cisco, because it's relevant to collaboration. It's relevant to the jobs we do every day. And it's relevant to our companies and the industry transitions they're going through. And that's the reason we acquired a company called Tropo. Has anybody looked at Tropo? OK, awesome. Everybody here almost. So Tropo does voice and video, or voice and PSTN and SMS uh, APIs. And uh, the, the number one reason we acquired Tropo is, is uh, not because, now the, the main value proposition for, for a customer base is if I want to write a voice or a, an SMS application and I'm an app dev developer and have no experience with, with uh, Cisco UC or any UC environment, basically I sit in a project room and, and my product manager says, I would like our application to talk to those wires on those poles. And you're just mind blown, right? I have no idea where to start. I'm going to have to call my, my, my UC guy, and he's going to tell me there's this thing called JTAPI that I have to figure out. No, that's, it's not usable. It's not, it's not scalable as an application developer. And these would be the terms that, that UC engineer would throw around, speeds and codecs and, and all the different interoperability protocol standards, right? Uh, yeah, I don't. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I talk in these terms as a web developer, right? That's what Tropo did, is it translates that conversation. But Cisco didn't acquire them because of that core fundamentally value. Cisco acquired Tropo because traditionally when you build an application, you're very focused on the user experience of that application. Well, for Tropo, there is no user experience. The user experience is the developer experience. It's how you, ex you, you, you accelerate that, that development. So when we acquired Tropo, we didn't start trying to scale Tropo to take over the world for SMS. In all honesty, that's a commodity market now, right? Twilio loses money every day in that market. Our goal was to leverage them to help us build this developer ecosystem on this new future cloud we were building called Spark, OK? And that's what they've done for us. They built the Spark for developers ecosystem Tropo is still a very valuable part of that, but the number one focus for us and for them within Cisco has been building this developer experience. So they've released a couple different things, and we're really getting some scale out of, the, out of that initiative. So the first thing we did is we released these platform APIs for Spark. And the number one goal, or two goals really, is two, twofold. The first is we wanted to make it easy for developers to bring their workflows 
into the Spark ecosystem. And the second was, we understand not everybody's gonna spend their day in the Spark ecosystem. Some people have a different tool that their day starts and ends in. If you take a medical practitioner, they're probably in their medical record system. A salesperson's probably in their CRM all day. We wanna be able to take the Spark experience and embed it into those platforms as well. To do that, there's three things that have been released so far to do that, and you're gonna see a lot more coming in the future. Um, the first is the Spark Depot. Has anybody, everybody seen the Spark Depot? Just a couple, we'll, we'll preview that real fast. Um, the second is where we're gonna be focusing the second half of today is the uh, app integration services, where power users such as us can create uh, applications and workflows in just a few minutes. And the third is, is, is our full a platform APIs. Before we get to the app integration services, I wanna give a, a quick overview of these other two real fast, just so we understand where these iPaaS services fit in this ecosystem. So with those three things, we've created what I call this developer opportunity spectrum. And I think this is an important concept for me because I used to think, well, let me, let me back up. Bespoke or custom is like the worst curse word in IT, right? It used to be. It used to be, if I have to hire a custom developer, it means somebody's gonna come in and build something with knowledge that's gonna get lost, and when they get hit by a bus, my, my organization's screwed, right? That's not the case anymore. And why is that? Well, twofold. The first is, the people with those skill sets, uh, the number of people with those skill sets has grown exponentially over the last few years. And the reason is, is second reason is because the, the barrier to entry is so much lower. Now we are using web-based technologies that are standard and, re and restfully based, which means somebody can come in and consume those things knowing nothing about the Cisco UC proprietary backend. It's a very standardized web interface, so any web developer can interact with them. And what that means is I can evaluate this spectrum as an end user, as a department, or as a company as a whole. And I think that's important too because as an end user, I might wanna customize my own workflows, change the way that I interact with my collaboration solution, and if I'm an end user with no development skills, I can go straight to the depot and build my own application right there. If I'm an end user who's a power user, or maybe I've got uh, a, a department, like I think this, this is probably every IT department, traditional networking voice administrative department. Probably not a full coder because we've got other day jobs and we've had a lot of other skill sets to learn. But we probably aren't an end user with no power user skills. We can understand how to use some of these tools, which is why I love this session so much because I think it really applies to almost all of us. But as a company, I might have other resources internally besides just these power users. I might be able to leverage the web developer across the hall, or I might be an HR department who just hired my own development staff. That's happening, that's happening everywhere. A lot of people are hiring in their own development staff that can start to leverage those. So let's just hop right through. So now we know in that ecosystem where we kind of fall. We're not that person with zero development skills, but we may not have that full coding stack experience. And that's really where integration platforms come in. Cisco has taken a unique approach, um, and that is, if you look at a lot of other cloud platforms today, they've tried to build out of the box a lot of integrations. And I think it's important to note that that's not our strategy. Because how many people think that one big green button can magically connect your business's Salesforce integration with your collaboration platform in a meaningful way? We know that there's customs, uh, thousands of custom fields that everybody implements, it, whether it's your ticketing system, your CRM, your Salesforce, your ERP system, your back-end databases. There needs to be some logic. And that's where integration platforms come in. They support our APIs, and they support the APIs of just about every other cloud provider service, and it allows you to connect them in a meaningful way, but you get to define what that meaningful way is. And I think that's really important because you see a lot of integrations that say, we support 700, click this button to connect. You know how many people use those things? Not a whole lot. We've added what we think is valuable with those easy to use end user integrations in the depot, and we have a lot more coming. 
But this has been a huge part of that strategy for us is partnering with the biggest integration platform service providers. And that's unique to Cisco if we look at which ones we've partnered with. So I'm going to start with If This Then That, Built.io, and Zapier. These are kind of the three biggest ones out there right now that you guys might have uh, worked with or used. And I'm just going to give a quick uh, kind of overview. So like I said, They connect to all these different kinds of applications, these different RESTful services, and really allow scale for you. Um, important point to note, though, in most cases, if you've got something on-prem, you have something custom, you have something baked in-house, you're probably not going to find that listed on If This Then That's connection portfolio, right? It's, these are really kind of large-scale third-party services that are available in the cloud. Um, This is a great alternative to pro services or freelance programmers internally as well. And, and you'll see what, what we mean by that. So like we said, it's the, the kind of the power user spectrum here that's using these iPaaS services. And we're seeing a lot of third party providers, a lot of end users find these on, um, themselves. Um, if this, then that, I'm going to skip ahead to this slide. If this, then that, this last month, just had over 5 million flows run to Cisco Spark. That means 5 million business processes were optimized, pushed into the Spark cloud last month. So we're seeing huge uptick in adoption. And it's not organizations going, every end user is going to go to if this and that. It's every end user finding these tools and giving them the tools to be able to customize their own business process. So, Quick comparison between the platforms, just so you guys are kind of familiar with the ecosystem. If This Then That has kind of always been a consumer first platform. They are now just recently kind of pivoting into the enterprise space. Um, they are offering a, 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 a kind of a, a pilot, I will say, of their on-prem private cloud offering. Um, right now, they still haven't have a monetization scheme, so it's free. That's good for all of us, right? Um, entirely GUI based in the web. Uh, very basic. Literally, it is only if this, then that. That's why it got its, na its name there, and they have stuck to that. That simplicity is actually very valuable to, a, to the average end user, and, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. Because of that simplicity, they've kind of relied on all these different integrations from, from a large scale of, of number of clouds. So again, the level of config is very basic, and you'll see that when we go through some of the demos of, of what's possible. Um, if we start to go up the stack in complexity, I think Zapier is what I would qualify as the next kind of level of complexity. Um, it, is very, it has, from the, the beginning, been focused on the business user. Uh, they have a lot of security baked into their platform. They also have a, a private offering. Um, but they're kind of a freemium model as well, that you start with a, a certain number of credits. Um, it, the complexity starts to get a little bit more Uh, a high level, though, when we look at how much we can configure. So in, in if this, then that, I'm literally saying, if this event occurs, then do that. Zapier allows the options of adding a few filters or, or different settings in between there to say, if this happens and it has this value, then do that. Okay? And you'll see, you'll see that when we kind of uh, go through an example. Um, The kind of most complex in this stack is what I would call built.io. And not complex from an end user perspective, but complex from what power is available from the platform. Full disclosure, we've partnered very closely with built.io because they've been an excellent partner to us. They have really done a great job of baking in full support of all the Spark and Tropo APIs into the platform. They've also worked with us, and, and you guys will get a code at the end. Uh, for a discount uh, six-month subscription to Built.io. So we'll, we'll, Cisco is, will pay your first six months of your subscription to Built.io. Um, you didn't know you were getting free stuff, did you? <laughs> um, complexity, or the ability to configure, is very high. Okay? Um, and because we do get you, are, are going to get you guys access, I'm actually going to do a couple more demos on Built.io today than I would on Zapier or if this and that. Um, they just launched a new product called Built.io Express which basically is the equivalent of the Zapier platform, and that's included with your advanced enterprise subscription as well. So I think that's something that uh, is worth, worth showing there. Um, but as we go through these, keep in mind, depending on that use case you're thinking of, that use case could be extremely valuable for your business, and it could be as simple as just if this, then that, right? 
Okay. I'm done with slides. I don't like slides. Let's, let's just demo. Let's just walk through the rest of this. So you guys have seen the depot. Um, but for those who haven't, I'm going to walk through it real quick. This is depot.ciscospark.com, where we have dozens of integrations, now approaching hundreds of integrations here, that are available for end users to be able to quickly tie into Spark. So this is kind of like our own if this, then that. So if I maybe want to connect Box, maybe my enterprise uses Box. As an end user, I could come in. I will click on Box. I'm going to click Connect. It's going to ask me if I would like to allow Box access to my account. Let me log into my Spark account. It's going to ask if Box can do these things on my behalf. It's going to post messages into my Spark spaces. It's going to find the titles of those rooms and be able to know who's in those spaces for me. So I'm going to accept that. And now that I'm back in the depot, I get to actually click Add and add these integrations. So when I click Add under Box Integrations, um, I'm going to log in with my Box account now. Oops, i got to use single sign-on here. I will grant access to Box. So now in the cloud, as an end user, I've given Spark access to Box and Box access to Spark. Now the two can talk to each other. So now within the Spark depot, I can actually select the file or folder. So I'm going to choose 2016 presentations. And maybe um, every time something is uploaded or created in that folder, I would like to note, I would like to update. Let's go ahead and just do, uh, make sure it's not a big one. Cisco Live demo room. And I'm going to click Add Integration. Done. I just configured in the depot a business process or a rule to tie two cloud services together. Okay, So I wanted to show that, that we're building our own kind of iPads or integration platform in the depot. And if you as a customer have an integration to Spark that's valuable, you can apply and get those listed in the depot as well. Now I can see that integration. And if I go back to Spark, I can see that I added Box to that space. Okay. Pretty powerful. There's a lot of integrations. One thing I want to highlight here is if I look at these integrations tab, a lot of these I may not be familiar with as an IT user. That was kind of news to me. This was something I wasn't really familiar with. But when I started talking to marketing groups, I found local measure was known by just about everybody. And there's a lot of good examples like that throughout the demo depot here. What does that mean for you in IT? It means well, my end user is going to see something valuable, be able to connect it themselves, and it's done. They didn't call IT and say, hey, I subscribe to Cisco Spark. I also subscribe to Local Measure. Can you hire a pro services organization, have a three-month planning kickoff, and then have them come in site and integrate the two platforms? Right? So more relevancy for you with no additional work to leverage the, the, the platform. However, not everything's in the deep. Yes, question. They're integrations, which we can talk a little bit about. Um, so the difference between an integration and a bot is a bot has its own identity. And so we'll, we'll actually build a bot here in just a second. Um, and an integration acts on your behalf. So that maybe the difference would be I might have an HR bot, and I might message the bot and say, hey, I'm not feeling well. HR bot, can you put in my PTO or my day off, my sick leave? An integration might act on my behalf and know that I'm out sick. And when somebody messages me, might auto respond and say, this person's out of the office today. Or might do something on my behalf, like when a, full, when a file changes in my box folder, message my space or my team on my behalf. OK? All right. So, let's, so if this, then that. Let's just create one. I'm just going to hop right in and show, show you a couple examples. So what are some use cases here? Let's create a new applet. And it's this simple. I just create a new applet. They used to call these recipes. And it's as simple as clicking on this and then that. So let's click on this. What should the this be? The this can be a ton of different things. I just got a new GE washer a couple months ago. And the GE washer is supported in here. I can come in here and choose the GE washer as my this. When my clothes are done, do this action. Well, guess what that action is going to be? Notify me in Spark, right? OK. Something else I use often, ESPN. I hate their app. I hate their mobile app. It's huge. It updates every other day. 
and it takes another 100 megs of cellular bandwidth to update the app. All I want is one team sports scores, my college football team. When their, bas when their football or basketball team plays, update me in Spark. Also, notify me 30 minutes before game time so I can remember to watch the game, okay? So I can create these own personal workflows. That's where I think if this and that's pretty cool because it's kind of the individual user's preferences, right? Um, however, I'll show you the one I use often and we'll build this one out here. I'm gonna choose Amazon Alexa. Um, I have Amazon Echoes throughout my house. Uh, my fiance likes to add things to the shopping list and I need to know, and again, I don't want that app. Where am I at and where am I working throughout the day? It's in Spark. So I'm gonna say, when something is added to the shopping list, then that. Well, what is that, that gonna be? It's gonna be Cisco Spark and we want to Post a message to a Spark room. Which room? Let's go back here. Cisco Live De uh, DevNet demo room. And here's the message it's going to formulate. A new item was, ad item was added to your shopping list. Add item. Okay. I'm going to click create action. It's going to create that recipe between the clouds of Amazon Echo and the Cisco Spark. And now I'm going to click finish. We're gonna be taken to our applet here. Now, I don't have an Amazon Echo with me today, but I do have their web, web browser-based simulation tool here. So, Alexa, add apples to the shopping list. I've put apples on your shopping list. All right, so apples were added to my shopping list. Now, one of the things that is important to notice is if this, then that, some web services, it goes out and checks periodically. This is one of those, okay? Checks every few minutes. They say it could take up to an hour. It usually takes about two to five minutes. I'm just gonna click check now. Some services push into the If This Then That platform like ESPN or some of those others. They, they're pretty good about identifying which ones do what. Now if I come back over here, I just added a new item to my shopping list, apples, okay? So my fiance is walking through the house and goes, add whatever to the shopping list, and a few minutes later, I get a Spark notification, okay? I click this, if this, then that, okay? There are thousands of opportunities to, to customize the way you work, and there are a lot of different enterprise tools in if this, then that as well, okay? If we go to applets, and we go, let's create a new one here, and we look at all the things that are available as this is, as actions or triggers to, to, to act on, um, I can look at their Salesforce any action that takes place in Salesforce, right? So um, there's lots of different enterprise tools. There's Office 365. I could be calendar invite. I can now tie Office 365 to my Spark implementation quite quickly, okay? Lots of cool things there. However, if I'm looking at, if I'm using the example of Salesforce, um, or maybe it's uh, my ticketing system, um, when that, item gets created, maybe I want to check the value of that, right? Maybe let's take, for instance, uh, a ticketing system. Maybe I want, when a ticket is created, to notify people in Spark, like in like my email, right? There's a lot of benefits of that. I can create a space where people can talk about it. I can have that conversation ongoing. Um, but there's also the value of uh, being able to tie that relevancy and decide whether or not I should alert people. Is this a severity one, two, or three help desk ticket? Then I should notify. If it's not a severity three, one, two, or three, let's not notify, right? The other major thing is how many, how many people have man monitoring systems that email them? Okay, just about everybody, right? That email becomes a task. I have to delete it. I have to manage it. I have to put it somewhere. I get an email that my mailbox is full, right? In Spark, it's ephemeral. It's a great place to aggregate those types of notifications where I have a historical record in each space for those. And I didn't have to organize it. I didn't have to create an email rule to ignore it, <laughs> right? But sometimes we want to change the logic there. And that's where Built.io and Zapier with these express products can really kind of do that. So let's go ahead and create, uh, I'm gonna sh to, just to show you Built.io Express, I'm going to create a flow here. Somebody asked me a couple weeks ago if uh, Spark had the ability to schedule messages. Well, this is a great example of probably something we never really probably, it's not core to our product set to schedule outbound messages for a later delivery, 
But I can come in here and say, as a trigger, I can schedule something here once, or as was asked for at that time, the first of every month, so I'm gonna schedule this for March 1st, I want to, every month, send a message to my team to remind them that their expense reports are due, okay? I can schedule notifications now within Spark, and these, this is one of the actions that I could do within, uh, within the environment here. And now when I choose the action, I'm gonna choose Spark Bot, and I'm gonna choose Post New Message, okay? But you'll notice there's these little filter icons, okay, in between these steps and the actions. Now I can actually set some parameters. So maybe if we change that action to something a little bit more valuable, like let's change that to Jira. Anybody here use Jira as a ticketing system? Number of people, awesome. Watch this. I'm going to say every time a new issue is uh, created, I'm going to connect a dummy account here. It's not actually connected to a Jira system, but um, every time that that is done, now, I'm gonna create that Spark message. So when a new ticket gets created in Jira, I'm gonna create a message in Spark. But I wanna filter on the type of ticket. So now under the input, check this out. I have all the different values right from the Jira system, and I don't have to be as a programmer write if this, then that statements, okay? So now I can come and say if the issue type equals important, now I've created a filter that says when my new ticket gets created, if it's important, send the Spark message, okay? Super, super valuable, and you guys already use Jira, so you can go set this up in a few minutes, okay? Log in now, <laughs> okay? You can start to see that I can actually add other actions here too, and this is where these starts of, towards, uh, types of editors start to get a little bit maybe too cumbersome, because what if I have hundreds of filters here? I can add a lot of filters, but it's kind of hard to tell what's gonna happen, right? And I can't necessarily say, well, if it does this, do one action, and if it does this, do another, and if it does this, do another. That's where the enterprise built.io product comes in. So let's go into built.io, and I'm gonna just create a blank flow here. And this is the full enterprise graphical option. And now we have kind of a more GUI-based interface. It's visual. I get a mapping of the actions of what's gonna happen. This is where the flow is going to start, and this is where it's going to end. And there's all kinds of things I can do to define when this thing starts. Okay, we'll talk. We'll, I'll show you an example of what that means. But my actions now are listed over here, and maybe my action is post a new message. Check this out. I'm dragging and dropping it, and now I'm going to connect these lines. I'm going to say when my flow starts, post a new message, and then end. Okay programming functions and flow of your workflow with lines. Pretty powerful, pretty powerful to drag and drop that. I was on a call with a customer a couple months ago and they had uh, about 150 old cameras, really old camera system, but they didn't have the, the CapEx to replace their security system. And their security folks would go around on campus and when an, when an alert went off on their mobile device, they would run back to their Windows PC and open up Internet Explorer and go to their favorites and find the favorite of one of the 150 cameras to view the live view of the web interface off that camera, okay? We, we were talking and they were like, uh, now obviously I'd prefer that they'd upgrade to a Cisco security system, but <laughs> um, in the lieu of that, we can augment that workflow. So what we did is we said, I said, Does, do those cameras allow a notification to be sent? They said, yeah, right now it's just sending us an email. I said, well, what, what can that camera do? We went into that camera and looked, and it could send an HTTP post. Anybody familiar with that term? Okay, kind of like when you hit enter on a web browser, it's getting the web content. That was able to do a very basic web action, and we were able to point that at built.io, where we could start to create some business logic rules. What we did is we came into the actions here and said to start the flow, we're gonna start it with this, what we call a webhook. And a webhook just means exactly that. Two services that know nothing about each other can send a web event to each other. Pretty powerful stuff. So now we point the webhook at that URL and from the camera, and we added, we did a couple things. The first thing I did is I said, okay, you'll notice 
I have lines to two different actions. They both are post new message. Well, I don't want to post a Spark message twice when I get an alert. Well, you notice that the line's dashed. Well, when I hover over that line and I click on it, I can go to the settings here. I can set a condition on that action. That line is not going to execute unless the request query for building each equals two. Now, what do I mean by request query? That's the URL that gets hit. This is that webhook URL for built.io. And then after that, I add these parameters. Building equals one. And the URL is the URL for the live stream. In this case, it would be a, a link back to that own camera's web interface. Okay, For, for now, I just put in Google. Um, how many people use Postman? Awesome. That's awesome. That's great to hear. OK. So if you, if you don't use Postman, I encourage you to download it. It really lets you interact with the web without coding, but learning all of the RESTful principles. And so now I'm going to actually just show you. I'll show you what this looks like. I'm going to click Send. And now if we go back to built.io, look at that. It actually saw the event come in and highlighted the path it took, debugging at its finest. OK, <laughs> you know how long that would take to debug in code? Uh, so I get to see a visual representation of what my business process just did. It detected it was building one, and it said post new message. And now when I go into Spark, look at that. I got an emergency. There's an emergency triggered in building one. Watch the live video here. Click, OK? So now every one of their security officers has their mobile device. They click on the video link right from the mobile device. They get Spark rooms. And they have all their security staff for each campus in a different Spark space. They called me back about two hours later and said, we pushed it to 190 cameras. And it's now operational. It's production. Okay. That's the agility we're talking about here is start fast, build fast, fail fast. If they didn't like it, big deal. They spent the afternoon on it. right? That's the type of value we're talking about here with these tools. Um, I had another team that said, you know what, I've got a Spark space that I'd really like to have a bot. Okay? And we talked about the actions that could start this flow. Well, if I come into one of these flows, one of the actions that I get is, I'm going to actually come back and create a new one here. One of the actions I get inbound here is a Spark bot. So when a new message is spent, sent to a bot, it can trigger this flow. Okay. Well, if we start to think about the fact that this is pretty easy to drag and drop, I can start to build some really complex things. Check this guy out. <laughs> this is a little messy. Lots of different things that are happening. My Spark message comes in from a bot. It's being delivered to lots of different nodes or actions here. And I can do all kinds of things. By the way, I'm using as a database Smartsheet. Anybody use Smartsheet? OK. It's kind of a cool web-based Excel file, kind of like Google Docs. But it has a, a great API that integrates. So I can send somebody a link, and they can edit def data that this flow can, can access. So pretty, pretty cool. I, I actually sent that to HR, and they can fill out those phone numbers. So what happens is this is a bot. And I'm going to ask the, I'm going to mention the bot. And I'm going to say, help. And if we come back here. You're going to see the flow that it went through to answer my help message. Okay. Bam. The bot responded back and says, here's all the commands I can do. Well, I can add phone numbers. I can list phone numbers that are tied to this space. So let's list the phone numbers. Okay. You're going to see one of my mobile numbers listed here. There's my number. And I'm going to show you what this was originally meant for, was to be able to trigger a mass emergency notification and manage that list from within Spark. So I'm going to say, trigger an emergency and say, the building is on fire. Please exit immediately. OK? Now, it's going to take a second, because my US SIM likes to take a second to receive phone calls here. You can see the flow that it's going through right now. And we'll receive a phone call here in just a second. There we go. A corporate emergency has taken place. The building is on fire. Please exist immediately. 
An SMS has been sent to join the emergency bridge. All right. So we got a, a voice to text. We used the text to speech of Tropo, sent that from this, this platform. One last point I want to leave you with here. Check this out. I can push JavaScript code into these flows, little snippets. This is a great barrier to entry or removed for coding. I didn't have to stand up a web server. I didn't have to get a DNS address. I didn't even have to get a public IP address. And I didn't have to build the whole ecosystem to deploy code. I can now comfortably insert logic into the middle of my flows as little code snippets. Okay? This is an awesome tool to start learning the full development stack without that barrier to entry. Okay? All right. We went through use cases. I'm going to leave a little time, hopefully, here for q and I know we're running out of time. I want to give you guys quickly this link. This is a, we've, we bought memberships for our customers and partners for the first six months. Okay? Built.io slash Cisco Spark VIP. I encourage you to do checkouts out also, if this and that, Zapier, Workato, uh, Gupshup. There's a lot of different iPads partners on the depot that are available. And we're very supportive of, of all of them, but we really wanted, we felt that this was a, a really great tool for our developers. Um, there's also DevNet learning modules on the built.io. So check those out. Steve Greenberg um, has done an amazing job documenting for our channel partners and our customers on the DevNet Labs how to use built.io and get started with some of these tools. Um, lastly, this is the only way I get to fly to Berlin. <laughs> uh, Please fill out these session evaluations. I'd love to know any feedback, whether or not this was helpful, whether or not this met your requirements or your needs. Those feedbacks are extremely important to us, so please take the time to fill out that session evaluation so that we can continue to fund these different types of events and sessions for you guys. Um, other than that, there's lots of stuff going on in the DevNet zone. Continue to please check those things out. And if you want to learn a little bit more, I think the next good one is uh, kind of these, these 2020 and 2021 are good introductions to kind of bot building, how to interact with OAuth. Somebody asked about integrations versus bots. Those are great starting points. Um, I know I'm, I'm a couple seconds over, so I want to make sure we leave time for our next presenter to get started. But if anybody having questions, thoughts, anything we can address? Cool. Thank you guys so much for taking the time, and uh, have a great day.